Many years ago, I was traveling through Atlanta, Georgia, and I thought it was one of those Peachtree streets, of which there are many, but I think it's Tilly Mill Road, where the Jewish Cultural Center is located. And as I drove past it, I noticed a big sign. It said, Israel Expo. And anything about Israel fascinated me, and so I quickly pulled into the parking lot. Hanging down in front of the building, there were 12 long, beautiful, full-color banners, and each one was for one of the 12 tribes of Israel. I got out of my car, and as I walked across, I noticed over in the field, there was a tent set up and a crowd of people, so my curiosity pulled me over there, and it was a reformed rabbi, a liberal rabbi, who supposedly was pretending to be the rabbi of a kibbutz in the land of Israel. And at that point he was answering questions and one of the visitors, probably motivated by these big banners, said to him, what tribe are you from? Oh, he said, rather with a superior attitude, we're all, he said, from the tribe of Judah. That's what Jew means. All the other tribes were annihilated when they went into captivity. Oh, she said, I didn't know that. He said, yes, that's how it is. So I said, well, that's an interesting view. But, um, you know, I was just up at a display of uh, Jewish history and culture, and they were telling me that the, the black Jews from Ethiopia claimed to be from the tribe of Dan. And I said, you know, when you open the New Testament, I know you don't accept it, but when you open the New Testament, you discover a lady there from the tribe of Asher. Her name is Anna. And of course, Saul of Tarsus, he's from Benjamin. And John is from Levi, Jesus from Judah. But when Peter writes his epistle, he writes to all 12 tribes. He thought they were still in existence then. Well, sir, he said, we don't we're Reformed Jews and we don't accept the Bible. He said, we follow the teachings of the rabbis. Oh, I said, I, I see. So, like, who did the rabbis follow? I, I thought if you asked the rabbis, they would say they followed the Bible. And if they followed the Bible and you follow them, wouldn't you follow the Bible too? No further questions, he said. <laughs> and so we turned and I headed into the building. Well, I went upstairs and they had a display which was quite fascinating to me. It was on the Jewish festivals. And there were some school children there and they were looking around and there was a young Jewish lady, dark skinned, beautiful lady. Her name was Hannah and she was answering their questions. And at the end of the time they left and, and I came over to her and I said, now I notice here that you just have seven festivals. And she said, yes. And I said, well, like you don't have the non-biblical feasts like, uh, like uh, the Festival of Lights, uh, Hanukkah, and some of these other festivals. No, she said, we want people to know what the truly biblical feasts are. I thought, wow, interesting. So I said, well, you know, that's very important because God set a pattern in the Bible. Uh, he worked six days and then he rested the seventh. And he hallowed the seventh and he called it Shabbat, right? And you keep, that's, that's one of your festivals. She said it is. It's probably the most important, she said. Well, I'm not so sure about that, but it certainly is an important one. And then I said, you know, um, every seven years the Lord gave Shabbat, right? A sabbatical year and the land had rest. And she said, yes, that's right. And then I said, every seven times, seven years. Every 49 years, God added a 50th, the year of Jubilee. And that was a sabbatical year. So there were two sabbatical years side by side, the 49th and the 50th. And she said, that's right. And then I said, have you heard about the 70 year Sabbath? She said, no. I said, well, because the Jewish people didn't give the land rest as they should have, God kept track. And he said, you know, this isn't your land, this is my land. And I'm letting you farm it, but it's my land. That's why you give the first fruits every year to remind yourself 
that this is all my harvest and I'm letting you labor here. I'm letting you live here. And because you haven't given the land rest, I'm going to um, take you away for 70 years. And that's the prophecy of Jeremiah that Daniel discovered on far off Babylon and began to pray that God would deliver the people and bring them back. And that's exactly what happened. And then I said, you know, Daniel spoke about 490 years, 70 times 7. And seven years that are still left of that 490 years. And he explained that 483 years of those passed and at the 483 year mark, something earth shattering happened. She said, what was it? I said, Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. It wasn't his fault. And he was going to be cut off. I said, did you know Daniel prophesied that? And that it was 483 years exactly from the dedication of the temple in the days of Nehemiah until Jesus of Nazareth was crucified? She said, you must be one of those born again Christians. I said, by the grace of God, I am. She said, could we have lunch together? I've never understood what you people believe. And so we went downstairs and got some kosher coke and I don't know what else we had. And, uh, and we had the most interesting conversation as I shared with her the glories of her own scriptures and her own Savior. And that the New Testament was Jewish as well as the Old. It was written by Jewish people. But people who kept reading the scriptures until they found the answer. And as we talked, I said, Hannah, let me read something to you. And I read to her these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And it talks about Moses having a veil over his face because of the glory that was shining. But then we read that the Jewish minds were blinded. For until this day, says Paul, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ, in the Messiah. If you don't understand the Messiah, then you won't understand the Hebrew Scriptures. He's the key. Even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil lies on their heart. I said, Hannah, you have a veil on your heart. And that veil can only be removed when you understand that Yeshua is your Messiah. And I said, listen to the next verse. This is 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And I said, if you are beginning to see the light shining in through the veil, I want to plead with you to step into the light. Because if you step back into the dark, if you reject this revelation of your own Messiah, the veil will fall back again upon your heart and you'll never understand your scriptures. She was a very solemn young lady as we made our way back and as we came up the staircase, coming down was the rabbi. And she said, oh, calling him by name, have you met my friend? He said, we've met. And he kept his head down and kept walking. And she said, oh, he's not usually like that. I said, well, I asked him a few questions. He had difficulty answering. I said, you know, it's because the veil's on his heart. And that veil remains until you receive the truth that the prophecies of the Old Testament all point to one person, and that's Yeshua HaMashiach. I still pray for Hannah. I don't know where she is. I tried to go back and find her, but she had moved to Israel. And you can pray for her and many others like her, for whom a little light has shone in past the veil, that they'll have the courage to step into the light and receive the Messiah as their sin bearer.